in France. Sounds like Android Sing is a popular subject, unless you just missed the room in the next, uh, in the room next door. Okay, so I'm Mark Popperton. I'm a software engineer uh, for a small telco named Orange. You might have heard about it. I'm also a GDG founder, and I'm here to tell you a story about Android Things. So uh, a couple of years ago, uh, my wife and I were building a house, and we decided to not use regular heating systems and go for something a bit different, and we went for uh, this. A uh, good old uh, wood stove in which uh, you burn basically tree trunks. But there's a major drawback uh, to using such a system. Uh, basically, there's a huge inertia, and uh, it requires a bit of anticipation. Basically, if you don't want to go to bed in a room at 12 degrees, uh, you better start the fire uh, right in time. And if you start it too early, you end up being uh, basically half naked in the living room uh, by 42 degrees. So you, I needed some kind of way to know what the temperatures were in the room, uh, in the virus room of my huge house, and um, I didn't want to buy some expensive kit provided by some kind of uh, DIY store. And uh, so I had to build my own. But we have a problem here. Because uh, basically every time I use a soldering iron, it looks more like this than what you would expect to be, uh, being something like this. So I needed something that would rely on off-the-shelf uh, hardware and uh, on which I could burn some open source software. So uh, I set up for a few things uh, when hardware was related. First of all, I set up for Raspberry Pi, because it's dirt cheap, uh, on which I plugged uh, something called a Aerofix uh, trunk receiver. I don't know if many of you have heard about this. Basically, it's an antenna uh, that you can plug on a on USB. And um, what it does is that it's capable of catching the data emitted by weather station sensors. So I've got here all the hardware I need uh, to to build the system. So what I, what I did, I, I set up on this, found uh, an open source distro that I could put on my Raspberry Pi. So there weren't many at the time, so I found one installed it, and it worked pretty well. The UI was ugly, but I could check the temperatures from, from my phone and see how the temperatures were evolving in the virus room the virus. But that was okay if I was in my house. What, uh, what happens when I want to check the temperatures while I'm out of my house, which happens in winter, uh, let's say for Christmas, you go and visit your family, you don't want to go back in your home and it's 12 degrees, and you can't expect a bit when you're coming at home. This meant I had to find a way to access my data from outside my LAN. And this meant exposing my LAN to the dangerous hackers of the internet. So well, I put my sleeves up and said, well, okay, I'm not a sysadmin, but I'll just try and do, some, do my best. So I, I set up a DMZ with HTTPS uh, signing keys, thanks, let's encrypt for the free keys and everything. But I managed to have something up and going, and it was okay. So this worked for many, many years. Until one day when my router burned and I had to change it, and of course all my DMZ setup was to rebuild, I said, well, beep this shit, and uh, I'm going to do something else, and I'm just fed up with all this cranky stuff. And in the meanwhile, Android things uh, had uh, appeared, and I was wondering if I couldn't replace my distro running on my, Android, uh, on my Raspberry Pi with Android things. Who among you have heard about Android things? Good. How many of you hack or have hacked things for Android things? Much less. Okay, so for those of you who didn't raise their hands, um, Android things is basically a full blown Android core with dedicated IoT uh, APIs added. And it runs exactly uh, like you would expect an Android device to do. And you can build applications or Android things with your regular tomware, which means if you have Android Studio, you're ready to go to build uh, applications for Android things. Just one thing, you don't need to be connected via USB to your little device. Uh, once you've set up the network on your Raspberry Pi, in my case, you can just well, grab the IP of your device and tell uh, ADB to connect to it, and you're connected over Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or whatever kind of uh, network configuration you have. Okay, so my Raspberry Pi is set up, and I can start building for it. So the first challenge was reading the data. 
Um, because I don't know, can I, can I read the data which I emitted from my uh, weather sensors with my Raspberry Pi uh, using Android 6? I didn't know. So, our, the RFX uh, control receiver is USB, so there was some kind of hint I could do something there. So, Android 6 provide some useful APIs here. Uh, related to a USB, you've got basically two APIs. So, this is the um, Android USB host API, uh, which uh, it's quite heavy to implement. You have to implement all the heavy lifting. Basically, you're, you're writing a, a USB driver. Or you can use the uh, Android Things peripheral I.O. API, which enables you to uh, drive all the GPIO on your Raspberry Pi, uh, the PWVM, uh, U, um, I2C, and uh, also the uh, serial connection. Good thing for me, the antenna I was using, is seen as a serial device when you plug it in the USB, so I, I can go with the peripheral I.O which is exactly what I wanted to do. So, all I had to do now, uh, because I know that my uh, peripheral is seen uh, as a serial device on my Android thing, all I need to do is add a uh, little intent in my manifest to say, well, trigger my application every time a USB device is attached. So, just by adding this intent at the top part, your, your application will be launched every time you, you plug in a USB device. You can filter it because I don't want to, my app to be launched by any kind of USB device plugged in. I just want my antenna to be uh, uh, provoking triggers. So you can add a, um, a filter, a device filter uh, XML file, where you can say, well, I'm only reacting to products with such product ID or vendor ID. But once this is done, uh, it's just a matter of checking uh, with your nice Kotlin code. Uh, checking that the connected USB is the one you expect or not, and if it's the one you expect, well then all you have to do is uh, open a serial connection, set it up with all the regular uh, hassles of uh, serial connections, so that's both rate, parity bytes, and all of this kind of crap. And once this is done, all you have to do, you set a handler and wait for that uh, data to come pouring in uh, on your serial connection, which uh, you can then plug it to a function which will read your buffer and what you usually do when you're debugging something uh, first thing you do is printing it on the console so let's see what happens yes it works so I have my Raspberry Pi receiving data emitted from my weather sensors around the house and writing it uh, into my console well probably I don't know for you but I don't understand a single line of what is being poured out on the, uh, on the C slot here. So I've got to find a way to make it, make it a bit more readable. The huge advantage sorry, of open source, apart from being a source of free software, is that it's also uh, an opportunity to read existing code and well, understand how, how things are being implemented and re-implement them uh, in another way. So what I did, I dived into the uh, source code of the distro that I had previously, previously used. I almost drowned in C++, but managed to get up just in time to well, extract the specs of the uh, RFX com transfer receiver I was using, and then I could re-implement it in a more developer-friendly language, Kotlin, for example, and then uh, add nice things like provide uh, human readable uh, outputs and redo my tests. So this is what we get now. It's printing out uh, more understandable information. I have uh, what signal levels, I have battery levels, but I also have temperatures and humidities and well, device IDs. So I can now start to build a more uh, human-friendly uh, service. So this is printing on the console, that's fun, but me, what I want to do is pull out my phone in my pocket and check the temperature. So, I've got to publish uh, my information in some kind of way. So, remember when I said that uh, Android, Android Things is a full-blown Android core? Well, that means you can add libraries to your Android Things development, like you would do for regular uh, Android uh, apps. And you can add third-party applications, like, like say, Firebase. So, when you, you add the dependencies in your, um, in your Gradle file, and once Firebase is all set and done, it's just a matter of writing your data into a Firebase tree uh, node, and basically we're done. So let's see what happens. Yes, I've got data coming from my radio frequency sensors 
read by my uh, Android team device and written directly into a Firebase uh, real-time database where I can have a more user-friendly interface. So I could just set up with this and say, okay, I'll just go on the um, Firebase console and check the temperatures of the bedrooms for my kids. Let's, let's do this stuff. But, hey, that was only 300 lines of code just to get there. So 300 lines of code, really? I, I think I can write a bit more code and do something a bit better. So. Let's throw in a companion app, because basically every IoT device has a companion app for the basic reasons that most of them don't have screen, so you need some kind of, of way to have information. So let's add a module to our Android, uh, Android CEO project and build a companion app. So to do this, I decided to play a bit with the architecture components, and uh, I've used two of those. First is live data. I don't know if you've seen the talk this morning about the architecture components, but I guess you have. You try to now you know a bit more what you want to do. So live data for uh, well updated data, real time updated data, and a view model for uh, well persisting the state of my data without having to reload it every time it's on the screen. And once this is done, throw in a recycle view, a view, a recycle view adapter, attach it to the view model, and we should be done. And all you have to do is attach your live data to a listener to your Firebase uh, database. And every time there's data written in your database, well, your view model gets updated, and your UI should be updated too. Just quick notification, uh, if you've ever played with Firebase for Android, you might have noticed that by default, Firebase doesn't persist your data. That means that if your device is offline, and you start your app, you won't have any data, which might be a bit annoying if you, you might be um, in need of not read up to date data, but you might want to have the latest version that was synchronized. But if you want Firebase to persist your, your data, you've just got this syntax to add, and you'll say Firebase will save on your device um, the data which has been synchronized. So, does it work? Yes, I've got data pouring in my um, Firebase live database on the right. And you can see on the left, uh, so it's a screen recording because I, I knew my demo would fail on the on D-Day, but uh, you've got the screen being updated on my phone in real time with all the uh, information coming from the, um, the database. So I've used some architecture components, but um, I'm not a designer, so sorry for the UI, which might be a bit uh, painful to the eyes. If some of you are good in design and want to help me on this project, you are most welcome to join. So <clears throat> I've some kind uh, achieve what I wanted to do. I've got an application which is running anywhere and uh, which allows me to display data and it's in a secure way. I don't have to set up a DMZ or anything. Why is it really secure? I don't know if you've played with Firebase, but by default, Firebase real time uh, database are public. I mean, you read or write. It's not secure at all. If you get a URL of my database, you can just crash everything. So I need, I need a way to well, sign in. And to do this, um, I want my Android team device to sign in uh, on Firebase uh, using my credentials. Problem is, I can't uh, use a UI and uh, type my Google sign in uh, credentials to log in. What I need, I need a, a mean to transmit from my companion app data to my Android thing, and with, let's say, a token, which would be used to authenticate. So, this is where you throw in um, another, um, another API. First of all, I'm going to use on my, uh, on my mobile phone the Google sign-in uh, button, which will allow, allow me well, to get uh, <coughs> credentials, which I will then uh, provide uh, to a uh, Firebase auth uh, function, which allows me to build uh, custom auth certification um, certificates, tokens, and that can, I can then give to my, to my uh, Android SIM device. Snag is this year, this works only for the web version of the Firebase OS API. So I had to find a way to, uh, to host all, all this. Well, you can do it with uh, another product from Firebase, which is Cloud Functions. So you can do a backend, a serverless backend, and you just have to use a, a few bits of, um, of JavaScript. So using Google Sign In, Firebase OS, uh, the um, web Firebase OS API on a Firebase Cloud function I had a backend uh, which allows me to forge nice authentication tokens. So you can always try to grab this one and use it. There's a few Easter eggs in it which make it 
invalid. I'm not too bad out to put uh, so part of putting a real token on the screen. But once I've got this, all I need is a mean to transmit from my phone to my device <coughs> this, this token. And for this, you use an API which is named the EFI API. It's not very recent, it's, it's been around for a few years, but it works with Android Things. Basically, on the Android Things site, you start advertising, saying, hey, I'm a device which accepts connection. On your um, Android application, you start to describe and find the device, and once uh, well, they see each other, you just request a connection, and then you can say payloads. And using this channel, you can send the token from one side to another. So now I have secured my access to my Firebase database for my uh, Android C device, which is great. How long have we got left? A couple of minutes? So maybe we have plenty of time just to implement one last feature. Okay, Google. Because now my database is, well, uh, secure. I have already a Firebase uh, cloud function running. Maybe I can, I can throw in a few other things in the, in the mix. So, I'll use, uh, I'll use the dialogue flow uh, service to build my natural language understanding engine. And this will build all the rules for understanding my bad French and English speaking. And uh, all, what, all I need is a way to fulfill the, uh, the request and provide understandable information. In dialogue flow, uh, an action for Google, there's something called webhooks, which uh, enable, enables you to provide your fulfillments. And this you have to implement it yourself on the server. So either you've got your own backend and you implement the function on it, or you're like me, lazy, and don't want to maintain any kind of backend, and you go for cloud function. And all you have to do is implement your, your function on a Firebase cloud function. It only takes, I don't know, how many lines of JavaScript have we got here? Two, four, six, eight, yeah, 12 lines, 12 lines of JavaScript, which enables me now to have a nice, Google Assistant uh, application that works. If you say, let's say, uh, what's the script for this one? Uh, talk to my connected house. I want to know the temperature in the living room. It's going to trigger my cloud function and provide me the answer, which is that the temperature is absolutely unreadable on screen, but 21.6 degrees. So it works. Yay! So just using regular Google. Um, functions and, uh, and APIs and free for, for all of them. Uh, well, I've built a full-blown uh, DIY home monitoring system uh, without having to burn myself using a, any kind of uh, electronic building skills. And um, it, it works on any kind of device. I can update it over the air with the Android 6 uh, over the air update pattern. I've got a full DIY kit that I've built on my own and didn't cost me more than 200 euros. And that's it for me today. If you have any questions, you are most welcome. If you have questions in French, what are we done? No questions? Well, I'm easy to find. I've got a nice t-shirt saying that I'm part of the Son of Raspberry Pi. Uh, so uh, if you want to ask me questions, just follow me in the, in the place and you can ask me a question in French or English as you wish. Enjoy.